Sevier from Circuits and Sounds. I hope you all had a great holidays and a happy new years. I welcome you to the fifth part of episode one, low frequency oscillation and envelope generation. In my previous videos, we've been using these modules as our modulation sources for the TTO, the filter or the VCAs. But now it's time to take a dedicated look at what's going on behind the panel, as well as the extra features that I've added to the original circuit. This video will have a few less patches compared to my last couple, as we've already mostly heard how these modules affect the other ones. So hopefully this video won't go on for too long, but I've given up on putting a time limit on these things. They'll just go for as long as they need to, within reason of course. Before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you to the first 100 plus subscribers to this channel. I was honestly expecting to get to this point and have like 7 views on each video, 5 of those per month. So it's been awesome to see that people are actually watching these and enjoying them. So first, let's take a look at the LFO and how that works. So as the name implies, the low frequency oscillator oscillates at a much slower rate compared to the TTO. From a couple of milliseconds up to around 8 minutes maximum. Yeah, I'm not kidding. This thing puts the low in low frequency oscillator. I should have called it the slow frequency oscillator. Damn it. Anyway, let's take a close up of the LFO and see what we actually have here. So working from the top to the bottom, we first have an LED to indicate the rate of the LFO, controlled by this pot just here, with a faster rate to the left and a slower rate to the right. We also have two modes controlled by this switch here, slow or super slow which really is super slow. The first jack that we have is the sync out, intended to connect to the sync in of the TTO when we use a high frequency oscillation, which we'll talk about a bit more later on. Then down the bottom here, we first have a square wave with an integrated and differentiated square wave either side, which produces some different effects when used as our modulation sources. So let's plug the square wave into the TTO and start and build up an idea of how the LFO works. So for this patch, I just have one of the oscillators from the TTO going into the mixer for recording, and then the LFO connected through another patch cable to put into the TTO. So if I first unmute the mixer, we have a toner from the oscillator coming through. But if I take the LFO as our modulation source and plug it into the CV input, we can now hear how the LFO is modulating the TTO. And we can of course adjust the rate of the LFO and therefore how much of an effect the modulation has. But let's try this with a couple of the different waveforms. So let's first take the integrated square wave. Now you can hear how the modulation sort of rises up a little bit rather than just a straight up and down. And what about the differentiated square wave? So you've got a bit of an idea of what's going on here now. So remember how I said that the LFO can go as slow as 8 minutes at a time in its super slow mode? I haven't actually tested this or measured it, it's just based on a resistor capacitor value that I calculated. So let's have a quick look at just how slow the LFO can really go. And don't worry, I'm not going to make you sit through a full 8 minutes of waiting for an LED to turn on and off. So the LFO is currently set to its slowest rate in the slow mode. But let me wait for the LED to turn off and then I'll flick it to super slow mode and at the same time hit start on our stopwatch and we'll be able to see just how long it takes for the LFO to turn back on again. Well I can't sit around waiting for this all day. <laughs> 
けねえよけなあ9 minutes This is ridiculous Slow, but not this slow. Hey, fourteen minutes and twenty seven seconds. That's how long it takes for the alpha to change. What a wait. Almost fifteen minutes for the alpha to change. I just cannot believe that. Also, I just can't believe how far off the mark my calculation was, because that's almost double. But it's ridiculous just how slow the LFO really can go. Before we start taking a look at the circuit behind the panel, I just wanted to quickly demonstrate what happens when we take the sink out from the LFO and put it into the sink in of the TTO. So I have the LFO creating its fastest maximum frequency. And if I now unmute the mixer, we can first hear how much of the LFO signal bleeds through into the sink in. So if I sweep the frequency, we don't really get too much of an effect. Compared to when we use the envelope generator like we did a few videos ago. And this is due to what the maximum frequency of the LFO is capped at. It is still just slightly too slow to be able to produce the same effect as what the envelope generator does with its maximum frequency. Plus the amplitude of the envelope generator signal is a lot lower compared to the LFO signal, so we don't get anywhere near as much bleed through. However, we can get a similar sort of effect if we remove it from the sink in and just put it into the individual CV input. If I now unmute the mixer, We get some pretty funky sounds still. So we've pretty much covered everything there is to the LFO, and we've already heard how it affects the other modules in my other videos. So I think we should move on to having a look at how the circuit works behind the panel. In essence, the LFO is basically just an op-amp being used as a comparator, whose output voltage both adjusts its own threshold voltage, as well as providing current to charge the timing capacitors. So let's assume that on power up, the comparator is in high saturation. These two resistors just here form a voltage divider that supplies half the supply voltage to the non-inverting input of the comparator. And then this resistor here, being used as positive feedback, causes the voltage on the non-inverting input to change, depending on whether the output is in high or low saturation. We also have a negative feedback path between the output and the inverting input made up of the LFO rate pot and this current limiting resistor just here. We then have two capacitors, a 4.7 UF and a 470 UF, connected to either side of a single pole double throw switch, which are used as the timing capacitors for the LFO rate, therefore giving us the slow and super slow modes. The common pole of the switch is then connected to the inverting input of the comparator. On power up, whichever cap is selected, it is fully discharged at zero volts. Since we assume that the comparator is in positive saturation, current flows from the output and through the pot and current limiting resistor, and begins to charge the timing capacitor towards the output voltage. The high saturation output also pushes current through the positive feedback resistor, and raises the threshold voltage in the non-inverting input to above virtual ground. When the voltage in the timing capacitor rises above the threshold voltage, this shoots the output of the comparator into negative saturation. This then pulls current through the positive feedback resistor and reduces the threshold voltage to below virtual ground. The capacitor then begins to discharge towards the comparator's negative saturation output voltage until it reaches below the threshold voltage which then causes the output to shoot back into positive saturation. This cycle continues indefinitely and produces a square wave, whose rate can be adjusted based upon the amount of current allowed to flow between the output and into the timing capacitor. 
We then have these components down here being used to create a charge reservoir and also create a visual display of the LFO rate, which is actually back to front to what the LFO is doing due to the way that the LED is wired. So what I mean is that when the LFO is in high saturation, the LED turns off. And then when it's in low saturation, the LED turns on. This is because the charge reservoir is needed to create a bit of extra current to light up the LED. Otherwise the flashing can ever so slightly modulate the other modules through the power rails. On the right hand side here, we can see where we modify the shape of the square wave. We create an integrated square wave by applying passive low pass filtering via this cap and resistor just here. Then the differentiated square wave is created through passive high pass filtering. Since the capacitor blocks DC, only the rapidly changing edges of the square wave are passed through, but the high and low levels rapidly decay away, which creates our funky looking waveform. We also take two direct outputs from the comparator, one being the square wave, and then another square wave to be used as the sync signal. So as we can see, the LFO circuit is fairly straightforward and is one of the simpler ways to create a basic square wave. I'm thinking of experimenting one day though and placing a backtroll over the LFO rate pot so we can then add CV functionality and adjust its frequency with another external signal. But that's a project for another time. So next, we move on to the envelope generator. So what exactly is an envelope generator? Well, it's not the machine that makes these things. An envelope, in musical terms, is what is used to describe the change to a signal over time. Generally, this refers to the amplitude, but it could also refer to the pitch or the frequency or also the cutoff and the filter. The envelope generator is what we use to create the attacks and decays to modulate a signal's amplitude or pitch. A full-scale envelope generator will usually have four main parameters, attack, decay, sustain, and release, otherwise known as the ADSR envelope. So if I put this graphic up on the screen, and then imagine that I have a piano in front of me, if I hit a key, the attack is used to describe a signal's amplitude as it rises from no sound at all to its maximum amplitude. So if you've ever played a piano before, you'll notice that the harder you hit a key, the louder the initial attack's amplitude rises. The decay then refers to the decrease in amplitude from the attack phase before it enters its sustain phase, which refers to the average amplitude of the sound's duration and how long it is held for, which in the case of a piano is only a second or so. The release then refers to how long it takes for the signal to reach its minimum value as it leaves the sustain phase. So let's go back to the close-up down here and take a look at what we actually have on the envelope generator. In the case of this envelope generator, we only have the attack and release, which I called the decay because it sounds way cooler. Plus I didn't have room to write the word release. <laughs> and these are the only parameters that we have for the envelope generator. We can independently adjust both the attack and the decay with a faster frequency time to the right and a slower time to the left. And then of course any combination in between. As you've probably noticed by now, half the knobs in this synth are all wired back to front. So some of them are faster to the left, some of them are faster to the right, but I'm the only one playing this, so it doesn't really matter. Moving further down, we then have a few switches to control how we want to use the envelope generator, and in which mode. Our first one controls whether we want the envelope generator to self-oscillate or constantly repeat the envelope indefinitely. And then to the left, we have the manual mode. The manual modes are then further controlled by this switch down here, with the what I call the fun button mode to the right, and then the gate mode to the left. Which brings me to the jacks down the bottom and the concept of gating. First off, we have the generated envelope output, which we can then use to modulate a signal's amplitude or pitch. Then to the left, we have the gate input. So what exactly is a gate mate? So imagine a gate on a farm being used to separate two paddocks meadows for you non-Australians, with a bunch of sheep in one of them. And then imagine that I have my piano with me again, which is used to control whether the gate opens or closes. I know, this is bizarre, but stay with me on this one. If I hit a note, the gate is suddenly swung open, and the sheep are allowed to go to the other paddock and mung out on the juicy green grass on the other side. For as long as I keep that key held down, the gate is kept open, and the sheep can keep flocking over. But as soon as I let go, the gate is suddenly closed again 
and sorry if any sheep were stuck in the way and now go flying, but they can now no longer travel to the other side and are stuck with their terrible looking brown grass. Okay, so that was a bit of a weird comparison, but this is basically what a gate does in the synth world. When a gate is activated, a signal can travel through to wherever it needs to go, but as soon as the gate is deactivated, the signal is held where it is and it's business as usual. In the case of the envelope generator, when a gate is activated through the input, it will first begin its attack cycle and then rise towards its maximum value where it will be held for as long as the gate is activated, creating a pseudo-sustain phase. Then as soon as the gate is deactivated, the generator will enter its release or decay cycle and then start falling towards its minimum value, staying there until the gate is activated again. So in this case, we have two ways of creating a manual gate for the envelope generator, either with the fun button or with an external gate from somewhere else. All right, so now that we have an idea of how the generator works, let's get into a quick patch with it to give a full overview of how the generator works. So for this patch, I just have the basic signal path of the TTO going into the filter, and then the filter going into the VCA, and then the VCA into the mixer for recording. And then I have the generated envelope coming through this green cable into the buffered multiple. So now we have three copies of the generated envelope that we can now patch around the system. So if I first unmute the mixer, we can hear the tone from the TTO coming through. But let me first activate the VCA. Now we can hear that the amplitude is being modulated in time with the generated envelope, as represented by the LED. But let's now take another copy, and we'll put that into the filter. So now we can modulate the cutoff. Now let's take another copy, and we'll put that into the TTO. So now we can modulate the frequency. And now we can play around with the generated envelope. So we can get all kinds of crazy timing with it. So let's now have a look at the manual mode. So if I flick this over the other side from the repeat, it's now set to the button. So every time I press it, it begins the attack phase. And then rises towards its maximum for as long as I hold the button down and then stays there until I release it. Now what about the gate mode? Normally a gate input would be taken from a keyboard controller, so that every time we press a key, it generates the envelope where we can affect the modulation that we need. But instead, I'm using the square wave from the LFO to create the gate. So if I now flick this from the manual mode and the button to gate mode, Now we can play around with the timing of the LFO, the attack, and the decay. Alright, so I think you got an idea of how the envelope generator works now.
Alright, so let's jump into taking a look at the circuit behind the panel. Let's first take a look at the bottom left hand side down here, where we create our manual gates for the generator. We can also assume the mode switch up here is set to manual, instead of repeat. We first have a single pole double throw switch to select whether we want to use an external gate signal or the fun button. Both of these modes work in the same way, so let's imagine that we're pressing the fun button for this part of the circuit. When the button is pressed, it drops 12 volt across this resistor down here, connected to 0 volts, which causes current to flow to the base of the PMP transistor via this current limiting resistor just here. This causes the transistor to act like a switch being turned off. With the transistor turned off, current can now flow through the button, through this other current limiting resistor, through the switch, and then through this forward bias diode, the attack time potentiometer, and another current limiting resistor which can then finally start charging up the capacitor down here. The voltage output from the capacitor is buffered by a high impedance source follower made up of this N-channel JFET just here and its associated resistors. The gate of the JFET has a very high impedance, so it only allows a trickle of current to flow through it and the rest is then used to charge the capacitor. The envelope voltage is then output at the junction between the JFET source pin and its load resistor. So depending on how long we hold the button for, the more charge that is allowed to fill up the cap, and therefore raise the voltage presented at the envelope generator output. So as you heard, if you hold the button for long enough, eventually the cap will be fully charged, and the generator outputs its maximum voltage, creating the pseudo sustain phase. Then if we let go of the button, 12 volts is no longer applied over the resistor connected to zero volts. Instead a negative voltage, relative to virtual ground, is applied to the base of the transistor via the resistor chain made up of these two down here. And this now biases the transistor to turn on. Under this condition, current can now flow between its emitter and collector to zero volts. This then causes the cap to start discharging via this chain made up of the current limiting resistor, the release time potentiometer, and it's now forward bias diode, and then back through the switch, and then down through the emitter of the transistor, to the collector connected to battery negative. Therefore, we can independently adjust how quickly or slowly the cap is allowed to charge and discharge via the attack and release time potentiometers. So moving on, how do we achieve the repeat or self-oscillation functionality? We use this op-amp here as an inverting comparator with its output connected to the junction of the diodes. These resistors down here form a voltage divider that applies the virtual ground voltage of 6 volts to the non-inverting input. However, because of this positive feedback resistor, it can cause the voltage of this input to be higher or lower depending on the state of the output. When the output is in high saturation, it swings to about 3 volts above virtual ground, pushing current through the feedback resistor and raising the voltage on the input to about 1.25 volts above virtual ground. Then when the output is in low saturation, it swings to about 3.5 volt below virtual ground, pulling current through the feedback resistor and reducing the voltage of the input to about 1.5 volts below virtual ground. Therefore, the state of the output can affect the threshold voltage of the comparator. When the comparator is in high saturation, the timing cap begins to charge via the feedback path to the switch and then through the chain of components again. The voltage on the cap rises towards the comparator's high saturation voltage until the output voltage of the buffer, being dropped onto its load resistor, exceeds the threshold voltage on the non-inverting input. When this happens, the output of the comparator suddenly shoots into negative saturation, and the timing cap can now begin to charge via this chain of components again. The voltage on the cap drops until the output of the buffer now goes below the threshold voltage on the non-inverting input. Then the comparator shoots into high saturation again, and the cycle continues indefinitely, giving us a repeating envelope voltage that we can now use for modulation throughout the synth. I'm also wanting to experiment with the attack and decay pots and see if putting a Vactro over them does anything. Being able to have voltage control over the attack and release pots would expand my options so much further for making sounds and noises. Well I think that pretty much covers it all for today. Join me next time where we'll finish off taking a look at the last of these modules and then finally conclude episode 1. Once again, thank you to everyone who has liked, watched or subbed these videos. See you next time!